by Francis uh, Charles. Francis is the advocacy director for World Vision's uh, Syria Crisis Response. Um, welcome, Francis. And uh, here with me in Geneva, uh, I have uh, Balthazar Sahe, who is the Deputy Director General at the International Committee of uh, the Red Cross. Uh, welcome, Balthazar. So without any delay, I'd like to uh, now go to our uh, first speaker, and uh, I'm going to actually ask uh, first uh, Balthazar. Balthazar, can you, can you clarify what this really these humanitarian principles mean uh, when we talk about humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence? How are these principles applied in today's complex world with uh, government involved, involved in conflict, non-state actors, groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, and so on? Our world has become really very complicated and, and and in a way it affects very directly not just the operations, but often we see the lives of humanitarian workers. We also look at ICRC as really the custodian, in particular this year since it's the 50th anniversary since the adoption of these principles. So Balthazar would be welcome and would love to hear your views on, uh, on what do they mean and how these principles apply in today's world. Over to you. <coughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Panos, and welcome to all participants to this webinar. It's a great pleasure to, to, to share this moment with you that will hopefully be a, 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 an interesting debate. I think what is very important when we talk about the fundamental principles, and I'll talk about the seven very briefly um, that apply to the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, is of course that they haven't just uh, uh, been sort of conceptualized in, in, a, in a lab, but they are a, a, a humanitarian ethics and a practical framework that has emerged over time. Uh, since the very inception of the ICSC 150 years ago and of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement in a larger frame, and they have been sort of crystallized and been conceptualized 50 years ago, and I think provide a, a lot of inspiration. And I wanted perhaps just to say very briefly, because there is often a confusion also around them and the different nature of them, and, and this debate is necessary, and I welcome it, we welcome it, that of course there is a certain hierarchy in these principles. And as you see, I think, on the graph that should be on your screen, humanity, which means preventing and alleviating human suffering and protecting life, health, and respect for the human being, is the absolute key principle that sits on the top of the pyramid, and, and, and intrinsically linked to it is impartiality, which is, uh, of course, helping according to the need, making absolutely no discrimination with regard, say, to race, political beliefs, gender, etc. And impartiality is also mentioned in the Geneva Convention, humanitarian, impartial humanitarian access, such as the ICC, but also others, of course, should be granted access to the people they try to help and protect. And I think there is, it's very important that it's not only about relief, it's not only about providing assistance, but there is this dimension, dimension of, of protection that is absolutely important. So these are the, the goals, humanity and partiality are ethical goals. And then we have basically tools to reach people that need to be protected and assistance. And there, neutrality and independence comes into the game because um, I think decades of, of experience have clearly shown that it is uh, in conflict zones easier. I'm, I'm not saying it's, 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 it's always easy, but it's easier, if you can have come back to the pyramid, Tom, uh, 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 to access um, uh, um, the victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence uh, if uh, um, um, you are um, perceived as not taking part in the overall design of the conflict, if you don't take part, if you are neutral, if you don't take sides in hostilities, and if you are independent enough to be credible in this neutrality, because if you are seen, or if you are indeed uh, subject to a political agenda, the belligerents, but also populations, will not uh, accept you. The, the last three, I won't comment in this webinar because I think that we don't have many people from the Red Cross and Red Crescent, but these are the three other principles uh, that uh, organize the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. One of them, perhaps one word, is on, on unity. There is only one Red Cross or Red Crescent, Red Crescent Society per country, but it has to be open to everybody. And I think we will talk after this about Syria, and I cannot underline enough 
how important it is, of course, to national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies with their volunteers in each and every town in countries of conflict to play an absolutely vital role in a, in a, in a principled humanitarian response. I think what is important if you talk about principles, that actors that subscribe to the principles uh, should not do that in a sort of, they cannot auto-proclaim a principled approach. Uh, very often it is the context, it is the affected populations, it is the belligerents that actually hold the mirror and you have to look into this mirror and if they challenge your respect for the fundamental principles, you have of course do some soul searching and I think we will come back uh, to the fact that very much it is a struggle, it is an effort, it is not just a, a light switch uh, to have principled humanitarian action. It is in today's world admittedly very challenging and it is also challenged to be what we call a do not or, or a principled humanitarian actor. Um, what I would perhaps like to say as a concluding remark to the, to, 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 to the first question of panels is to say it's important that principal action is not presented as the only possible approach. There may be relief actors that have a political agenda, a military agenda. I think it's very important that each and every actor walks the talk. The ones who want to subscribe to these principles and feel that is the right way have to walk the talk. Others who want to intervene, others who want to intervene in conflict zones with, with different approaches um, uh, should indeed very clearly state according to which parameters they intervene. Thank you. Thanks, Baltazar. Um, it's interesting to hear the acceptance by people, what you said. Really, the, one of the most important is that people understand, people respect, and people accept. And this goes to everybody um, in order to uh, be able to go through. The challenge of respecting these principles, uh, respecting neutrality, independence, impartiality, supremacy, you also both talked about unity and neutrality uh, and how they come out together. But also the fact that it's not just about the principles, but looking really in a more comprehensive way the whole approach. So, Valdezar, I'd like to come back to you and ask you. Um, Obviously, how for colleagues who are listening now at the field, how can one balance this principle approach with the pragmatic situation at the operations on the ground? Is there a balance and a compromise or way between the two of that? In particular, for our colleagues who would say, yes, good enough. But you know, in our day-to-day -day work, how much can we really try to balance the two? Can you, can you give us some examples of how ICRC have gone about this very difficult uh, balance, as you also said, that's not the only approach. How do we bring the two together? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, difficult, of course, to uh, give a, a, a precise way how to do it. I think what is very important is that we live in a very fragmented world, but we live also in a very connected world, which means that basically people are watching the different actors. The ICSC is being watched, so it is very important that we strive to implement these principles. And our president recently said the contrary to principled approach is not pragmatism, it's unprincipled approach, which means, of course, if you try to be a principled actor, you need to constantly adapt to a context and you need to interpret it, these principles. These principles do not provide a, a, a miracle solution. As I said, it's not a light switch. It's understanding the context. It's building dialogue with the actors. It's understanding the political dynamics without getting entangled with these dynamics in order to deliver a response that is purely humanitarian and that is purely impartial, that tries to serve the most needy. Now, of course, there may be situations where you do not have immediately access uh, to all uh, the persons affected by conflict. And I think there you have to make a credible effort. A, you have to be transparent, so you have to communicate about what you can do, but also what you cannot do, where you are prevented from reaching populations. And you have to make a credible effort to reach these populations. And I think as we come back to the Syria 
example, in the first um, six months of the year, we had uh, several hundred of field trips. We had about uh, over 20 cross-line operations. These are extremely delicate and dangerous operations where you have to negotiate not only with the authorities, but also with the various armed groups, uh, uh, their uh, um, acceptance that Red Cross and Red Crescent convoy uh, crosses uh, 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 a cross line. We had uh, end of August, for instance, one convoy going into Alep, and that means also that all the snipers of the different armed groups and, and of the authorities hold their fire, and, and, and it's extremely dangerous. So I think at the end of the day, it's basically having an acceptance-based approach on the, and, and being close to the population in, in close proximity requires that people accept you. And I think that acceptance is also a way to gauge to which extent people think, yes, they are making a credible effort, even if they may not be 100% there, they may not be able to, 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 to serve 100% in an impartial way all the, all, all the persons, but they are clearly driven by such uh, intent. So it's a sustained effort over time, and it's a sustained effort globally. You cannot be a principled humanitarian action in Somalia and an, and, and an unprincipled humanitarian action in Afghanistan. We have had fighters somewhere in the bush with their mobile phones um, uh, telling delegates, well, we saw that in that press conference you gave in Washington. We don't agree with what you said. So you, you have to constantly, in a way, be in a dialogue with all the stakeholders and have a, a, a credible operational global identity where people see that you are absolutely committed to walk the talk with all the difficulties that reality puts in your way. Thanks, uh, thanks, Balthazar. <clears throat> Adopting to the context is what I heard you saying, but also understanding the political dynamics. The bottom line, I think we all agree, is how can we better serve the people who are not in need? Um, I also take note of your point on sustainability over time, the constantly being in touch with all the actors, the constantly networking, preparing uh, them, updating them. I have to say, a few months ago, I was really in a very complicated operation, and I met with the ICRC head of the office, and he told me how he really spent two years building this step by step, person by person, to establish a network which is really a very, very complex operation on the ground. Talking of operation, I'd like to take us now all to Afghanistan, to Kabul, where uh, we have uh, Mark Bowden uh, live, the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General and the uh, Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator. Uh, Mark, welcome to this uh, webinar discussion. I'd like to ask you, in a complex situation like Afghanistan, where you have multiple actors, you have the politicians, the humanitarian actors, the military, the non-state actors, the donor pressure, who also would come with their own priorities and vision. How do you manage all of that? How do you apply the humanitarian principles in your own day-to-day -day work in Afghanistan, and what challenges have you faced so far? Mark, over to you. Mark, can you mute yourself? Mark, uh, can, did you hear me? Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, did you hear the question? Mark, over to you. While trying to sort out the technical problem with Mark, I'm actually going to take us to Nairobi. And uh, I have a question for uh, Francis, Francis Charles, who is the boxing director for the World Vision, working on uh, the Syria crisis response. Uh, Francis is joining us from uh, Amman, Jordan. So, Francis, um, you're working with the World Vision, an NGO that actually has a monthly mandate. Um, I'd like to ask you, when you work on actually on both sides of the spectrum, in particular in protracted crisis, as an NGO, as a vision, when you're confronted with this principle uh, and your day-to-day -day operation, how do you apply them in this humanitarian response? Can you share some concrete examples of the challenges you face 
and how you were able to move forward. So, uh, Frank, it's over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, panel, Senna. And good to hear that the slight correction there that I'm actually speaking to you from Aman Jordan as uh, our response to World Vision covers Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, uh, Jordan and Turkey. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that obviously in Syria, apart from the politicization of aid, access problems, whether you're multi-mandated or purely humanitarian, still remain the biggest and most serious challenge. Um, I'm going to touch on access briefly as I think it's worth noting the staggering discrepancy in this crisis as opposed to others where access is perhaps a little easier. And I put a few points on the slide there in terms of statistics, uh, looking at uh, besieged, uh, besieged locations, besieged communities, the fact that we're really with the separation of cross-border assistance and cross-line assistance from government-held areas and armed opposition-held areas, the fact that we're really, in some cases, only able to reach 3% of people in need and oftentimes not even uh, not even anyone. Little as Balthazar was mentioning, the authorization to go cross-line is extremely difficult in Syria. And there can sometimes be very few entry points uh, for negotiation. Now, I think rather than going to the to go to the broad details of politicization of aid, I'm, I'm sure many are aware of Syria. I'd like to, to focus on those specific operational challenges that multi-mandated agencies are facing and bring those to the forefront to kind of address and illustrate how these larger challenges specifically affect agencies like World Vision. So I think that the first thing to say, if we can skip a couple of slides to talk about the, the challenges, in areas we are, we can actually reach. There, there are challenges in terms of demand from armed groups and the Syrian government, uh, essentially to interfere. A particular tension for multi-mandated agencies with both a humanitarian and a development mandate in Syria is the mix between humanitarian ethics and development ethics. The latter, which are of course based in ideology of political liberalism on principles of equality, rights and law. And I think Anyone who's aware of any of the context in Syria can see that this clearly brings a perceived clash for, for Western NGOs or INGOs with some ideological elements of political Islam adopted by certain armed groups in Syria. So, for instance, World Vision, we used to work in ISIS-held areas but had to move to new operations, uh, new operational areas after demands were made on us to operate in a certain way that was not in line with our humanitarian principles. And initially, this only affected practice such as beneficiary selection, uh, inclusions and distribution lists, and methods of delivery. But then, as time grew on, uh, this was further complicated by demands that affected our development ethics. And particularly for us, this was gender division and, and, um, and health provision. So a lot of those, like I said, those principles of equality, rights, and law that are interpreted in a certain way by the development ethics of multi-mandated multi NGOs don't sit comfortably with uh, the ideology of some of the armed groups in which we are encountering in Syria. And obviously this means less aid, frankly, to those in need under those areas in which we decide we can't work, as many other INGOs took the same decision that in uh, some ISIS held areas it's just impossible to operate. Uh, another really concrete example, um, in this time descending from, from a government, is that the Tel Shabab crossing in Jordan, it's the only one approved by the Jordanian government for NGOs to use cross-border. We're actually only allowed to use two or three local pre-approved organizations, and we have a lot of concerns about the neutrality and information provided to the Jordanian authorities, including beneficiary and staff lists. Um, you'll see on, on the second slide there, after all about demand from armed groups to interfere with practice, this concept of humanitarian principles being a new concept in Syria. So the history of civil society development in Syria, which is a limited number of organizations with centralized oversight, high state control, and a very limited space, and indeed number of UN agencies and INGOs, means that humanitarian principles are, were quite a new and almost a foreign concept to Syrian local councils, population generally, and those newly established NGO partners that have sprung up in, in response to the, the great needs. And although we've been able to train on initiatives such as joint operating principles, it's really immensely challenging to try to ensure application of principles when there's such a new way of thinking. Uh, this applies to programmatic and financial management and monitoring and evaluation in particular. The other complication when it comes to this is the, the question of remote management. As I said in the earlier slide, access is so very limited in Syria. The, 
there's a huge difficulty in terms of implementing what I would call our code of conduct principles about community participation, capacity building, sustainability, accountability, because of the sheer limitations in access. Uh, I'll give you an example. Most INJOs going cross-border from Turkey are only allowed up to six registered humanitarian staff to cross on a regular basis. So you can see in terms of capacity building in northern Syria for to increase training on humanitarian principles, it's extremely challenging to do. Another contextual specificity more broadly in Syria is that all everything is incredibly localised. There's no overarching government in Northern Syria that's fragmented armed groups. So all our interactions are extremely ad hoc. We do a lot of work with local councils and we find that each of them are very unique and kind of implement how they like. Some of the local councils are under very high pressure from armed groups in terms of interaction with NGOs. And other local councils, I would say particularly Azaz, are more able to stand up for their own jurisdiction. And again, this raises concerns on impartiality, beneficiary selection, aid distribution, and aid, and aid actually reaching and being diverted to armed groups. A lot of the local councils are under considerable pressure to support their communities with limited resources. And while other local council leaders come from the traditionally powerful families within a community, some often the local councils have clear sympathies for the opposition and are either aligned to them or in fact will face intimidation from armed groups by not being aligned. Uh, but because of lack of access, there's really no alternative to, to work with any other actors and the local councils is basically the only kind of functioning form of governance that you have for a lot of communities. And I'll just, uh, the last times I particularly wanted to raise, again, for uh, multi-mandated agencies in particular, is this question of, of negotiation. So by operating with humanitarian principles, um, we negotiate for access directly with armed groups. But the situation in Syria is incredibly fluid and fast moving. There's a high turnover of armed actors, and those delegated representatives with whom we interact frequently change. So you might be able to establish a relationship, but then you're forced to start again from scratch as the territory changes hands. And again, a challenge specific to multi mandated agencies. Unlike the ICRC and MSF, we don't really uh, routinely invest in internal capacity building for our own staff in terms of negotiation skills, which means that even if you are able to establish a working relationship with one representative, should that representative change, it's not necessarily guaranteed or it's a struggle to recreate that or be able to do so on a regular basis. So I think, again, some of the, those are the, the key operational challenges that multi-mandated agencies like ourselves are currently facing in Syria. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, uh, for, for painting a really complex mosaic, a mosaic that is uh, incredibly localized, the context changes, and uh, the fact that you almost have to start from scratch every time in order really to make sure that the principles are understood and that the all actors respect the work that uh, you and all the colleagues are trying to do in this operation. A huge challenge. Now, I would like to come back to you and ask you if you can give us a concrete example. Can you give us, can you describe a situation where you had to safeguard, in order to safeguard the principles of neutrality, partiality, independence in your operations, in the, in the theory crisis, what concrete steps did you have to do? I know that many colleagues following from around the world would be really interested to, to hear uh, concrete examples of how you went about it. Uh, Francis, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Thomas. And I'm glad we actually have this opportunity to talk about some of the really programmatic ways we can deal with this. I'm going to start with my most clear and obvious example. It's often an example we give to donors when asked how we're managing to navigate this mix of compromises or almost enforced compromise principles. The first thing we, we do as an organization is the transferal, the transferal of liability in sending commodities. Now, as I say, with limited amount of staff that are able to access, to gain access inside Syria, the fact we're often doing a lot of remote management, we transfer the risk of aid getting diverted to our suppliers. So in contracts we have with suppliers, they're actually held accountable for any losses. So again, we transfer the liability to them. So at checkpoints, if armed groups skim a couple of boxes off the top or take any of our commodities, we don't actually give cost recovery for those diverted items. And you know, since using this approach, we've had 0% of our commodities diverted. So that's a very practical example of some of the things that we can do 
Um, I to expand a little bit, we do though have to be incredibly firm with all parties to the conflict and we actually need to work as a community in terms of not bending to pressure to be forced to operate in certain locations or under certain conditions. There's a, we, there's a creation of joint operating principles for those NGOs working cross-border out of Turkey into northern Syria, which has uh, given us a, a common framework for engagement with armed groups, uh, particularly as we were operating there long before the UN coordination system arrived. So those uh, joint operating principles for armed groups developed by the INJs is helping us in terms of common framework. Um, another example about how we choose to operate with Inside Syria, whilst as an agency we have explored the possibility of working out in working out in Damascus in order to reach as many as possible, and we know that the recent, the new humanitarian needs overview for Syria uh, demonstrates that there are 13 million people in need now. That number has even gone up from 12.4. Um, so we really do need to work as an international community to reach as many of those as we can. But it's very difficult to work with the Syrian government in terms of restrictions, approval of activities, and bureaucratic impediments, particularly for NGOs when we're trying to respect our humanitarian principles and impartiality. The Syrian government expelled three UN staff members for maintaining contact with armed groups. Now, clearly for us, it, it, when we work in our, in our armed opposition areas or areas held by armed groups, it's critical for us to preserve operations in other areas. So we've actually prioritised working cross border into Syria to maintain working within our principles as far as possible. But I mean, I'd say just briefly to sum up, generally in Syria we are extremely restricted and challenged in terms of safeguarding our principles without losing access to it populist people in need. And if we are entirely rigid, we can compromise that access or have it closed off to us. You know, that our principles really are under continual strain as we make those compromises and accommodations to reach people. And again, as I mentioned earlier, also under strain are our code of conduct principles about community participation, capacity building, sustainability, accountability. So I think I would sum up and say most importantly, and here I, I believe strongly that I, I agree with Balthazar, that we have to be pragmatic. And for me, I would say that it's uh, the you must take your principles and add your context, and that is what can create your operational practice or your policy. Principles don't exist in a vacuum, a theoretical vacuum. Um, you really have to have a strong understanding of context to know how to use them. It must be a context has to be this lens through which you see the principles, and every organisation has to determine their flexibility and appetite for compromise, and also their capacity for context analysis. You know, if you don't have good, strong in-house context analysis, particularly as a multi-mandated agency, you can really struggle with how to apply those uh, combination of humanitarian and development ethics to sort of create your operational practice or policy. And I think, just as a last note, we would urge that donors would do well to also consider that compromise or struggle that we have, uh, particularly in the Syrian context. A lot of donor counter-terrorism legislation can really further complicate matters. We saw that in 2013, 2014, that donor concerns about counter-terrorism laws and the risk of aid falling into what they would, or what they have labelled as terror, the hands of terrorist groups, definitely slowed down the cross-border response at least. You know, there's a lot of bureaucratic and monitoring hurdles. So, kind of when we are able to adopt those innovative ways of working, such as transferal of liability, those are kind of things where we're prepared to be flexible and we'd really like to encourage the donor community as well to see that as a priority. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Francis, for uh, what I would call a, a shock of reality, really. Uh, in the Syria context, uh, with the state, non-state actors, uh, the donors, and the uh, humanitarian act workers uh, taking forward the humanitarian response. I heard you talking about uh, a simple equation that I'm sure is not very simple, it's a very thin line and almost impossible, that taking the principles plus looking at the context and coming out with a reality plan with the objective of trying to reach as many people looking at the capacity of the conflict analysis, but also your message to everybody, including the donors, who also find that is loud and clear in terms of where we would like to be going. I'm now going to take us uh, to, to Kabul, to Afghanistan, where uh, we have uh, Mark Thousand in a technical problem. It's now been resolved, so Mark, welcome online. Mark, I'd like to ask you, you're working in a complex situation. Uh, with the multiple actors. You have the uh, politicians, you have the humanitarians, you have the military, you have the non-state actors and the donors, as uh, Francis was also explaining. 
how do you balance all of this in terms of the humanitarian response? What are the challenges you are facing in the Afghanistan context, and how do you move forward? Uh, Mark, over to you. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, can you hear me this time? Uh, Mark, we hear you loud and clear. This is excellent. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we've had a lot of technical problems. Uh, and uh, I, uh, let, let me just start by saying uh, I think that uh, uh, part of the uh, way in which I use the humanitarian principles here is very much uh, as other uh, discussants have put forward the idea in terms of uh, uh, negotiating access and creating uh, greater uh, space as humanitarian coordinator. I think part of my responsibility is to try and create a better operational environment uh, for all those involved in humanitarian assistance. The, uh, the challenges, I think, uh, uh, in that, uh, first of all, uh, is uh, the, the issues of communication uh, down to the field level, because while there is acceptance of those principles uh, along a broader uh, as a broader policy framework, both by government uh, and by uh, Taliban, uh, the uh, uh, the issue is not as clear cut for people in the field. The field commanders uh, don't necessarily uh, understand uh, the adherence to principles uh, in the same sort of way. So I think we have to be aware that although they are very straightforward uh, as principles, for their, the sort of uh, the understanding at the field level is, is often very different. Uh, the uh, uh, other sort of challenge that I think uh, uh, we face, and I think we probably all face, uh, which has been referred to, is in, in actually the interpretation of impartiality. Uh, because impartiality for many agencies and organizations is always uh, restricted uh, by the level of access and by security constraints. So it isn't possible to get uh, levels of assistance to all those in need where, where that, that need uh, is required. And that in turn has uh, a major impact uh, on the uh, uh, issue of perceptions, uh, particularly uh, on, on, on the ground. So I would say that uh, the uh, the, the, some of the, the real challenges are not so much at the, uh, at the higher levels of, of discussion uh, over the principles, but, but more in terms of uh, the implementation uh, on the ground. The, uh, the way in which I think we, we have made uh, progress, uh, and perhaps I should talk a bit more about the context of the United Nations, which I think is different uh, for others. Uh, than others uh, is in getting uh, a broader acceptance by both parties here in Afghanistan uh, of the, uh, the overall UN position, uh, one of, uh, 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 of our own adherence uh, to humanitarian principles. Uh, and uh, there I think that there has been a lot of progress uh, in terms of uh, both the the Taliban uh, accepting uh, that the UN uh, is uh, a neutral uh, and impartial player. Uh, in fact, I think both parties, uh, both main parties to the conflict, uh, feel a need for the UN in all its various uh, guises. Uh, and we can't, you know, we can't easily separate in the UN, however much we try to, the fact that we are also involved in political. Uh, issues with both parties, but there I think it is important that our political statements are also seen to be uh, neutral uh, uh, and, and impartial. Uh, the, uh, so there is, uh, I think, an achievement in terms of greater acceptance uh, of uh, our, our overall role uh, and uh, a desire by both parties of the context to uh, maintain and, and improve the humanitarian access. Uh, that, I think, is not always the case in a number of countries around the world in an area where, where there has been progress. We, we're lucky here uh, in that uh, uh, the, the new government 
certainly also uh, respects far more and understands the need uh, for the independence and action by all humanitarian players. And that's frequently not the case on the governmental side in a number of other countries that we worked in. So I think that uh, comes about as a result of quite a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, both uh, lobbying, dialogue, and discussion uh, at, the, at the senior policy level. The, uh, the challenge, as I said, is how far uh, that goes down uh, to the field. And there, I think that the, the challenges far more uh, for us uh, are, uh, are in terms of you know, the increasingly difficult uh, security environment uh, that we, we have to, to work in. Uh, and uh, I think that that uh, also affects the issues uh, of humanitarian principles, not just in Afghanistan, but also uh, in a number of, of other countries. And as I said, I think the, the challenges uh, as the perceptions really of the, uh, as a result of, on the impartiality of the organization. Let, let me stop there. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> a very complicated situation. Let me ask you, um, you've painted again a difficult situation there. Would you say, from your experience, that uh, applying the principles in the Afghan uh, context has enhanced the efficiency of the humanitarian response, or has it really hampered it, has it limited what you can do? What's your experience from the Afghanistan operation? Over to you. Well, I, <coughs> I personally think it's enhanced the quality of the humanitarian response uh, first of all, by providing a far uh, clearer focus uh, for the way in which the, the response is directed. Uh, I, I should say that perhaps one of my uh, concerns about the, uh, uh, the current humanitarian debate is that we continue to broaden uh, the humanitarian debate uh, to undertake all sorts of actions uh, that aren't necessarily perceived by the broader uh, population of those who need on the ground uh, as humanitarian actions. Uh, so I think that uh, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, the application of humanitarian principles uh, has focused our assistance into those areas uh, that are uh, clearly defined as falling under uh, the areas where IHL needs to be applied, uh, areas that are contested and generally areas in, 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 in conflict. Uh, and so getting that focus, uh, in, I think, has improved both the effectiveness uh, and the, the perception uh, of the activities that we undertake. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm actually going to start now questions uh, live. And, uh, Thank you all for having sent uh, several questions. I'd like to encourage you to continue sending questions in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. We will be delighted to take your questions, your challenges in your specific context and see how to take them to your own operation. And the question we have received is actually Balthazar for you. I'm going to ask, uh, start with here. It's about this correlation between the principles and the protection of the people we're trying to help. How does it work? Can you give us an example from ICRC's operation where protection and respect, respecting the principles actually work together? Uh, this challenge of pragmatism and how to solve it, how to balance it uh, again. So, Balthazar, over to you. Thank you. Uh, um as I briefly said at the outset um, of, of this, this webinar, uh, the protection agenda is incredibly important to the ICSC, which means not only to responding after violations occurred, but also really trying to, to influence the belligerents. And if I say belligerents, I clearly have both uh, state actors and uh, non-state actors uh, in, in mind. Now, in order to have meaningful impact in the field of protection, you need to have the proximity with the affected populations. And you need to be able, basically, to be able 
to engage in a dialogue with belligerents on how they conduct war. And, and IHL, as, as, as you pointed out, is, 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 is a, an, an effort to, to reconcile humanity with military necessity. So it's not an idealistic law. It's a law which admits that wars exist and are fight, but, but poses certain rules. And in this sense, I, I have myself made interventions, protection interventions, say, with non-state armed groups, and they would never they would never accept such interventions if they didn't know that you do it also on the other side, and vice versa. So there is an imperative that uh, um, actors accept you, and that brings me back to that element of proximity, but also of intent. The actors, in order that you can have a protection dialogue, be it talking to detainees about the situation, be it talking to the detaining authorities, and that may sometimes also be uh, uh, non-state armed groups that, 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 that hold people, uh, they will only accept your remarks and, 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 and your interventions if they believe that it is not driven by any other consideration than the principles of, of humanity, of, of, of alleviating or preventing suffering. If they feel that you are part of a political agenda, uh, they will simply uh, find it very difficult to listen to you and to engage with you. And I think in this sense, I find it interesting what's, what's said bef beforehand. I think Mark mentioned the sort of humanitarian discourse sort of being, being used to cover a lot of fields. And perhaps on this whole principles debate, we are a little bit victims of our success, which means that the, 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 the humanitarian principles are now used in a variety of fields that clearly go beyond the initial humanitarian action. And I think as people sort of use these terms for all sorts of activities, including sometimes, you know, political action, state building, which are uh, le legitimate efforts of certain actors, but they may simply not conceptually be, um, 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 it, it may be difficult, conceptually speaking, uh, to say that they uh, follow uh, uh, the human term principles. How can you do, for instance, state building and being neutral? You have a project, you have a political project. Project, you try to, to create stability, or as a state, you do counterinsurgency. If you do that, and then at the same time say you're independent, you're neutral, you don't take sides, it, it's a contradiction. And I think, actually, the principles are relatively easy to understand. I have had many times to explain these principles in discussions, at checkpoints, in the field, I think they aren't that difficult to get. What is difficult is, of course, that belligerent populations basically say you don't walk the talk, some of the actors, or they confuse and say, well, under the guise of these principles, all sorts of stuff has been done in this context. So I think it's more the confusion around the principles that the, the, the principles uh, uh, themselves. And that brings me back perhaps to one issue that was mentioned before by, 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 by Francis. She talked about the, 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 the multi-mandated organizations and missions, I think we have to be very careful. What do we mean by multi-mandated? I know that in certain contexts, that the term multi-mandate, and I'm not saying that this was uh, Francis' intent, but, but, but can induce a, 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 a confusion, namely if humanitarian action and develop, the, the development um, agendas uh, conflate. And, and I think that the belligerents have a lot of, of common sense. They observe the actors. They basically look what we do, and they say, is that purely humanitarian? or does it further the interest of my enemy? And if they perceive, rightly or wrongly, that what is being done furthers the interest of, their belly, of, their, of the opposing side, there is, there is a real risk that they will not accept your presence and, and your actions. So I think we have also to recognize that humanitarian action has limits. It won't fix the root causes of the conflict. It may contribute to, to a climate which may be conducive for societies to leave power behind them, but it, it, it cannot deliver on all what needs to be done. And I think that there is a, a, a need and, and, and a quest for a certain modesty of both humanitarian actors, but also the, the, the principles that underpin humanitarian action. Thanks, uh, thanks for the that to bring us back to also reality in terms of how far we can go. And indeed, it's uh, balancing the humanitarian development, uh, working with the government in place, with the whole sovereign authorities at the same time in conflict situation where in some situations the government is part to the conflict then that really makes it uh, very challenging for us to be able to move forward. I'm going to uh, take us to a uh, second question and uh, frankly the second question is to you.
The, the question is really, it's a bit provocative, but basically the caller sent a question saying, come on, world vision has a clear religious connotation. We all here know about it. At the same time, how do you ensure this perception by the actors on the ground where you advocate about your neutrality and independence? In today's world where perceptions are very important, how do you apply the principle as a world vision? And I guess this could be applied to a number of other organizations where whether actors will see a cross or to see other signs and may interpret them uh, already or, or give, have them have a certain perception about it. Uh, Francis, over to you. Thanks, Thanos. I actually think it's a brilliant question. And um, as you know, World Vision operates in over 100 countries around the world in various different contexts. Um, so working out how we are perceived in each of those different contexts and making sure we are, uh, are still managing to maintain respect for our principles is incredibly important. I'll keep my answer to the Syria context. Now, I think the first thing is to say, and this is an interesting finding that we have had, when we're working in, in context with other faith-based NGOs, we actually have found that a lot of other faith-based NGOs, be they Jewish, be they Muslim, have actually enjoyed working with us because there is still a common identity as a faith-based organization. And so actually we found it has enabled us to work more closely and in better cooperation because they have the same understanding of what the organization is based on, which I said I don't think is something that is very easily talked about. But actually, like I said, other faith-based organizations in countries where um, in countries where religion is a, is a a huge part of society actually have sometimes preferred to work with us because they find our ways of working or at least trying to identify with what we're trying to do. Um, I think the other thing to say that, and maybe this is a relation to us being based as a Christian organization, the conflict in Syria is a sectarian one. Uh, we know that the Sunni Sia split is one of the huge complexifying factors involving regional actors, including Iran and Saudi Arabia. And this is not a, a conflict between necessarily Islamists and Christians. Now, for extremist groups um, like ISIS, who have said it's not just necessarily Christian-based organizations, but in fact anyone who is not choosing to side with their particular religious view are actually perceived to be people they don't want to work with. And I would say that for Syria, and again the question was how, how are we perceived, it's really I have found and other agencies have found that it's much more of a problem being associated with the West generally. So not being to do with having a religious base, or faith base, but rather to be connected with, with the West. And I would say that particularly since the start of the anti-ISIS military intervention, we have struggled to gain acceptance in those areas because of any perceived links uh, either a US-based organization, and in fact, you know, across the board, not just for faith-based organizations, but any large INGOs, um, staff attentions in those areas have increased. So I think, you know, as World Vision, it, we've actually managed to do well in terms of coordinating, particularly with local partners. But as I say, perception is very important and making sure that we are constantly engaging with armed actors and communities, explaining that whilst we're a faith-based organization, we're also a humanitarian organization, and that respect of our principles is paramount in order for us to be able to have access and doesn't affect our interventions on the ground. It's very important. So I would say perception key and community engagement and working through explanations of our mandate, ensuring that accountability that communities can ask those questions when they want to understand is very important. Thanks, uh, thanks, Francis. Uh, I'm going to take another question, and I'm going to take us uh, back to Kabul. Uh, Mark, um, the question is about balancing political, humanitarian, and development issues. So the question is, how easy is it for you, Mark, to maintain the humanitarian principles in Afghanistan, where the political mission and the diplomatic presence are all seen to be much more important or having a political agenda that is overarching much more vital than anything else. So how do you balance this political development humanitarian in a pragmatic way in the Afghanistan context? Mark, over to you. 
uh, well, uh, I, 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 I've been used to balancing them in, in a number of different environments, but I think the first key to this is that uh, actually there is interest in the humanitarian agenda, uh, uh, self-interest from both uh, both the uh, parties to the conflict, or both the main parties to the conflict. I mean, our challenge is not uh, uh, with them. Uh, what we haven't really talked about is uh, the, the groups uh, outside uh, this, I mean, the development of ISIS uh, and, and other groups who don't want to recognize uh, the, those issues. So, uh, so accepting my, uh, the, the role of the, and the need for uh, a humanitarian dialogue uh, is actually, I think, quite well accepted by uh, a number of the parties, and it, it sets its own balance uh, in that way. The, the challenge in terms of balancing humanitarian and development uh, is more in uh, terms of the, the way in which people like to see resources uh, uh, allocated, and I think this is a bigger uh, issue uh, in terms of, of balance. Uh, in many cases, I think people, uh, agencies, organizations confuse their work uh, in terms of humanitarian and development uh, to maximize uh, their financial uh, sort of support uh, uh, in this area, depending on, on what looks to be the most appropriate funding stream. And I think that actually is a challenge, again, uh, for all of us. Uh, in terms of the potential confusion it leads uh, in terms of the, of the work and the, the, the agenda. Uh, on the political, uh, uh, on the issue of uh, humanitarian and political, uh, there the separation, I think, is, uh, has been uh, well established, uh, both within the UN uh, and, uh, 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 and, and more generally. Uh, in that the, uh, the dialogue that takes place is entirely separate uh, uh, and has, in a sense, firewalls uh, in terms of the, the nature uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the dialogue that takes place, uh, both, uh, uh, with, 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 again, uh, with, with all parties. But uh, in the UN context, uh, I think we're also fortunate here in having uh, a, uh, uh, an SRSG uh, who has a strong human rights background and a very strong understanding uh, of the need for the separation uh, of functions and the lack of confusion. And now, I, I would accept that this is not the case across the board in the UN uh, and that there's still more work that needs to be done uh, within the UN system uh, to identify uh, the importance of that. So let me let me stop there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. I'm going to take another question that we received from one of the callers, and I'm going to address it to Balthazar. And the question is: Do the principles only apply in conflict situations? How about natural disasters, Balthazar? Yes, uh, thank you. Abs absolutely. The, the principles uh, also apply uh, in natural disasters, and I think it brings us back to the hierarchy of the principles that I mentioned at the outset. So the principle of humanity and impartiality, I mean, impartiality uh, uh, applies absolutely in natural disasters, but it's true that the principles of neutrality and independence are less important in natural disasters. Because in natural disasters, you usually, if they aren't happening in conflict zones, you, you usually don't have much of an issue with regards to people questioning your independence, is there a political agenda or not. So it is admittedly less complicated in natural disasters than in conflict zones. And perhaps to, uh, to, to echo what, what also Mark said, um, we, we have, I think, the international community, we have seen the pendulum swing from one side to another, and we have seen a tendency to basically have integrated missions in which state-building political agendas and humanitarian actions were linked and humanitarian action was seen as one of the tools either to do counterinsurgency or to further a political agenda. And I think if this integration uh, can provoke rejection by the ones it aims, uh, uh, can, 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 can provoke uh, rejection by certain parts of the conflict. And the problem is that you cannot 
be principled in one part of the world and not in another. And it's a question of sustainable effort, sustained effort, sorry, sustained efforts geographically and over time in order to build the credibility in a connected world where you have in each and every context, you have a number of fighters that may come from other contexts and that can cut both ways. We have known that certain fighters who have known the ICSC typically in Afghanistan, where we have decades of history, they may pop up in other conflict zones and they say, well, the Red Cross, we have had good experience with them, you can trust them. Uh, inversely, if you are an actor that is badly perceived, uh, uh, that reputation may actually stick to you. So, uh, so, so it's true that principled approach, as I said, is something that takes that takes time uh, to build a reputation must be globally managed, takes time to build. But if you look, for instance, at the post-earthquake Nepal operation, uh, we have been able to have a largely collaborative uh, uh, response in, in, in a natural disasters. And even the use of military assets, if you're in a natural disaster, is not as problematic, of course, than if you use military assets, military logistics in a conflict zone. For, for us, it's an absolute no-go to use military logistics, in particular of a part of a conflict, in, in a conflict zone. If you operate them as the Red Cross and Red Crescent, often it's more the national societies and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent societies that would do the bulk of the work and less so the ICSC. But it's less problematic than to use, for instance, uh, uh, military trucks or, or airplanes in a natural disaster. Thanks, Balthazar. That's uh, loud and clear uh, your the commitment really in, in all situations, but of course it's much more that you can find than others. I have another uh, challenging question back to you, Francis. Uh, and the question is about training, training, uh, capacity building, advocating, sensitizing about the principles. And the question is, uh, in, in the Syria context where you're working, where you have extreme groups, you have uh, beheadings, you have really situations where we all cannot even watch or read when they happen. How do you go about training, about engaging, about this very patient step-by-step -step work that needs to be done with all actors on the ground in order to have access, in order to ensure this respect for the principles and respect for the humanitarian workers in the day-to-day -day world. So it's about training, advocacy, and again, pragmatic approach with all the situations and the actors of the ground. Uh, Francis, over to you. Lovely, thanks, Panos. I think there's kind of two or three elements to that question. So I'll start with the uh, with the internal side, which is how do we make sure that our staff are equipped to deal with those situations, and how do we kind of ensure that training on how to apply those principles in practice is a priority from HQ and from donors for those field staff. Uh, prior to working in Syria, I served in, in Eastern Congo and in Mali, and it was very clear that it was often with the, the burden fell to field staff to try and work out for themselves how they were dealing with, with that particular interaction. You know, they're really at the forefront of being exposed to the danger and risk of, of certain conflicts, and I think that the, the main answer in how we can resolve that is we really need to integrate better what is happening at the HQ theoretical level, um, trying to, and how to train our field staff, our national staff, on how to understand these principles and give them policies for engagement and tools and frameworks to use. We're very lucky at World Vision. We've invested in uh, senior civil military expertise. We have tools and analysis frameworks we can use to help that. But I know that even, even with us, making sure that that link is happening between HQ and the field offices isn't always easy. And I think that, that it's really our own end responsibility to ensure that conversation is happening so that the two the expertise and the theoretical understanding is very much linked to help equip your staff at the field level. Um, uh, in terms of training for non uh, for non NGO staff and, and those parties to the conflict, who we would hope to do so. I mean, really, we know that in Syria, the normal case of what we would say naming and shaming uh, for those actors who would like to be well perceived on the international stage doesn't really work in Syria. I mean, a lot of extremist groups really don't care if they're on the MRM list for abuses committed to the conflict. And frankly, we're blocked at Security Council level from even getting uh, the Syrian government on, uh, on lists for violations of child rights. 
So it is extremely difficult. I think that actually, you know, organisations like the ICRC who do have access to places that some NGOs don't uh, are doing a fantastic job in attempting to train armed actors on the on those rights and principles. But I would say in the Syria conflict itself, it's incredibly challenging. And I come back to what I said earlier about community engagement. And for instance, working with local councils, it's really only through uh, sharing those principles and why they're so important and how they can be applied in context. First, you equip your national and field staff to do so, but then you also work with communities. You know, the case in Syria is not that every single person works in armed actor. We work with a huge amount of local councils and, and the population. And working with them to help them understand principles, why we use them, how they can be beneficial, and then hopefully that spreading across through local councils, through their interaction as the representative of the community with uh, armed opposition groups, I think is very vital. But in Syria, it's a particularly, a particularly difficult challenge. Thanks, uh, thanks, Francis. Um, I have another challenging question, and the mark this time is for you. A very bold answer question. What are the listeners saying? We all read in the news about the tragic bombing of the MSF hospital in Kinduz in Afghanistan. Uh, that was really a reminder in terms of advocacy of humanitarian principles and uh, the need to also not just the conflict but make sure that everybody is aware of the role that humanitarians play and the work we're trying to do. So the question is, what were you able to do as a follow-up to this? And how can we ensure that this never ever happens again with me medical facilities, whether it is in Afghanistan or in Syria or any part of the world, they need to be respected. And of course, humanitarian workers need to be respected. And the statistics of humanitarian workers killed every year are actually getting worse and worse. So Mark, over to you about the MSF hospital incident. Thank you, Paris. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me say how uh, saddened um, uh, we all were by uh, the uh, airstrike, which uh, uh, had a devastating impact on the uh, MSF hospital in, 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 in Kunduz, uh, and uh, 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 how much I think uh, all of us here uh, in uh, the humanitarian community uh, have uh, been outraged by by the attack. I think that there are a number of, of, of issues that arise from it. First of all, uh, not just that uh, the hospital uh, was uh, uh, affected by an airstrike, but that actually the, the munitions used, the type of attack, uh, was totally disproportionate uh, in terms of the use of force uh, uh, and, uh, and, and also fairly uh, uh, and clearly uh, in, indiscriminate. Uh, so it does raise a number of very critical issues uh, in uh, both in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the the force used, but also uh, in terms of the uh, failure, clearly in terms of deconfliction and uh, uh, decision making uh, that uh, that took place uh, uh, that well that led to the, the, these events. Uh, in terms of action, of course, the UN is uh, fully supporting the need for an independent uh, fact-finding mission, uh, and think that that is is the best uh, way forward, uh, and have promoted that uh, very strongly. Here, we have uh, again raised the the issues resulting from this with uh, the force commander, uh, and uh, uh, I have to say that Otra itself. Uh, I was also very concerned because we had made various efforts uh, as part of our civic function uh, to try to uh, contact uh, the forces uh, involved uh, to cause a, call a, a cessation uh, of the, the particular airstrike. So our concerns are also to the breakdown in the communication side here uh, when we contacted the tactical command centers uh, so I think that there are a number of actions that need to be taken, both in terms of the, the general principles of the, the nature of uh, NATO support, uh, 
uh, here, but also uh, in terms of the what seem to be to us systems failures uh, in terms of, of communication, uh, and we are p pursuing those uh, uh, at all levels uh, fairly uh, uh, rigorously. Thanks, Mark. Uh, indeed, it's a tragic incident uh, that uh, we're all horrified to, to follow and read. Um, I'm next one is going to take us to, to Balthazar. In Balthazar, we have a question. Um, the question is about uh, related actually to a, an op-ed that appeared a few days ago, uh, signed by Peter Maurer, the president of ICRC, together with uh, Tatadeu Kanoe, the president of International Federation of Red Cross, and this, in this op-ed, they both jointly, both of them said that the biggest threat in our ability today as humanitarians to provide assistance is the over-politicization of the humanitarian aid and the humanitarian work. This is a very bold statement and that's really directly linked to the respect of the principles and, and how really we need to safeguard this uh, important role that we do in the best possible way. Can you, can you tell us what does Peter Maurer have in mind? Can you give some examples? What, what is it really um, in a concrete way? And more importantly, what do we need to do not to fall into that trap of over politicization or politicization of the humanitarian aid that we all agree is simply unacceptable? Uh, Balthazar, over to you. I think to the, to the extent of my understanding, uh, what what the op-ed said, what Peter Meyer said in the op-ed was a reflection of, of a concern that we have at, at the ICRC, and I, I alluded to it uh, in, in, in my prior in, in intervention. It means it means that basically, um, in, in 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 many conflict situations, humanitarian actors uh, are perceived as having uh, political objectives. So, so there is a question mark hanging over humanitarian actors as to the intent. And I think these question marks, they don't come from nowhere. They come indeed from a practice of, uh, that we have seen of conflating military, political and humanitarian objectives and using too liberally the very notion of humanitarian. And I'm not saying there aren't different ways of responding to the needs. They, they may be relief operations that are not humanitarian because they they only want to target part of the population of the home population or they they are here to serve a political or a military agenda or a counterinsurgency agenda what is very difficult of course if they are all presented under the label of principled humanitarian action and that's where the walk the talk is so very important because it's true in a fragmented world where you have so many different armed groups it is very difficult to reach out to each and every group. So it is a lot about perception. How do groups, how do also states perceive humanitarian action actors? And, and, and do they see them as pure humanitarians or do they see them actually pursuing a political agenda? And that is fraught with dilemmas even for the ICSC. I think we are widely recognized not to have any political or military agenda, having a strict, a, a, a radically, as some people say, principled attitude. But if we come to the humanitarian action and development divide, what we see is in countries where we work for decades, you can't just do emergency response. So you start to work, of course, with health structures. You start, in a way, to build capacity of local Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. And that immediately has a certain dilemma in it because as you start to build capacity and work in a more structural way, what does it mean? How can you manage to convince all the actors on the ground that this is not now any political agenda, it's not state building, you don't try to advance one political system that should emerge from it, but you simply adapt your humanitarian response uh, to needs that are far more uh, in protracted crisis in long term and you can't just do the sort of traditional what we used to do perhaps 40 years ago simply the sort of emergency response so of course it is fraught with dilemmas and as I said at, at, at the end of the day for me the real answer is the mirror the actors hold in your face do they actually consider you principles do they think that you are credible can you in the dialogue with them provide um, 
uh, responses to their questioning as to other agendas that, that perhaps you, that they, they, they may accuse you of pursuing. And you have to make a credible case with your practice, of course, uh, underpinning that, uh, that you are indeed pursuing uh, uh, purely humanitarian efforts. I think perhaps uh, a second aspect would be that we have seen that, that the, uh, an international system that finds it more and more difficult to really create peace and stability. We have an absence of convergence on how to fix some of the big crises and probably, paradoxically speaking, an almost undue intent if you look, for instance, the agenda of the Security Council on humanitarian debates. So the UN Security Council probably, if you look statistically, spends far more hours uh, uh, on humanitarian action, access, etc., than ever before. And that concentration on humanitarian issues of the political interest that sometimes also um, mirrors a certain uh, difficulty to really look at the hard issues and how do we actually fix uh, conflict situations uh, uh, also um, contributes to a feeling that humanitarian action is at the center of politics. Well, it should not be, in my view. Well, it's very clear that uh, you are actually articulated, articulating a frustration. Can you please mute him, Mr. Articulating a frustration that many humanitarian actors feel about uh, the lack of a political solution, this uh, absence of convergence to solve the biggest crisis, the uh, inability, <clears throat> the failure of the Security Council or the member states to come to a solution to this crisis, that then puts a lot of pressure on the humanitarians, and indeed the humanitarian response should not be in the center. The political solution has to be the one that is in the far from. Colleagues, we have a little bit, uh, just about 10 minutes left to the end of this webinar. I'm still going to take a couple of questions. In the meantime, I know to flag, I would like to flag that uh, you've seen there is a polling that has opened on the screen on the right lower hand side um, where we basically would like to have your view as you're still listening to the last uh, couple of questions as to how did you find this webinar? Was it useful? How can we improve it? Bear in mind that we are also repeating the same webinar in a few hours at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Geneva time. So please take a minute uh, while you're still listening to give us your feedback. We really appreciate your, your input, including on future webinars that you would like us to, to organize. I'm now going to, to take us uh, back to Aman. And uh, Francis, there's a question for you. Uh, and the question says, you as an NGO representative were used to the NGOs being really bold and crap. So the question is, as humanitarians, and as we're examining the principles, are we calling a spade a spade? Or do we compromise in order to accommodate governments or actors? Uh, how really do we apply these principles uh, in reality? And uh, do we speak up when we need to? Or how do you do it at the foreign operation point of view? So Francis, over to you. Thanks, Panos. And again, I think this is a great question. And uh, particularly as someone who has served in, in various different conflicts, uh, designing an advocacy strategy for a multi-mandate agency, the tension between, you know, the, the humanitarian mandate, which looks at prioritizing short-term need uh, and working at speed, and the development side of an organization, which looks at some of the value of long-term goals and processes of development. The question we were, we were constantly battling with ourselves as multi-mandate INGOs is, how far are we able to speak out about justice or injustice in an armed conflict such as atrocities or, or displacement or tension? And how do we balance this with, our prior, with, with the priority, the prioritization of need to be able to stay and deliver our operations? It's an incredibly difficult one, and I think that's why you know, operational agencies who know that in conflict we are at risk of being asked to leave for what we would call over-criticizing the government, it is a very real one. I mentioned those UN staff who, are, who have been uh, PNGs um, or expelled. And I think this is one of the reasons why you've seen a lot of work between the integration of human rights into humanitarian operations. Interestingly, in the Syria context, the resident of humanitarian coordinators and humanitarian coordinators have now been given increased humanitarian rights staff because we know that often it has fallen to the human rights organizations to really speak out um, 
against those atrocities where the humanitarians may have data but aren't, uh, aren't willing to do so. ABLE is a different question. Um, I would say generally I think that humanitarian work is becoming more rights-based and this concept of a rights-based and rule-based world, what kind of world order or way of working has become really a, a core part of humanitarian work. But uh, it's a great question. Do we call a spade a spade? How far do we risk calling out governments for fear that we won't be able to continue our operational work? I think it's something that every single INGO has to work out for themselves. How, how, much, how far is so much of an atrocity that you're prepared that you must speak out? Because, you know, uh, we do have not just, the, as Balthazar said, the question of humanity, this moral need to end suffering, not just in terms of operationally responding to it, but addressing it with the with our field based presence and knowledge that we have of how these atrocities are affecting people on the ground, that's the advocacy that we really need to be doing. Um, I'm afraid I don't necessarily have an answer to that question, apart from to say it's a very difficult balance. But I think integration of human rights into humanitarian work, as we have just seen in uh, in the Syria context, with actual seconding of human rights staff into the humanitarian operation, I think is a really good first step to try and address that balance. Thanks, Ms. Uh, thanks a lot. And I guess in every situation, as uh, both Mark and Balthazar were saying, is really, and, and yourself, is using, applying the common sense on that context to see what would help more and what would it lead to. Uh, again, this uh, principle and pragmatic and being frank, but at the same time looking at the context, which is uh, never too easy. Uh, Mark, the next question is addressed to you, and uh, one of the callers has sent us a question saying, how about the affected people? How about the, about the people we're trying to help? Do we engage them? How do we, we how can they contribute uh, to the respect and understanding of the principles in the operation? Can you give us the feedback on the example of Afghanistan? Mark, over to you. Yes, I, I mean, I think that uh, sadly that this is uh, uh, an area that uh, is is not uh, too well addressed with uh, the affected peoples themselves. I mean, Afghanistan does have uh, a very strong uh, civil society uh, element uh, here, and we're very strongly engaged with them. The debate uh, uh, is is quite important. Uh, <coughs> within civil within civil society, it varies a lot across the country, but that's the main channel that we have for, for taking this debate further forward. Uh, we've done a lot to try and and support and to build uh, civil society functions across the country, uh, and to make them the mechanism for uh, public accountability uh, uh, for both the actions of uh, donors, agencies, uh, uh, and government. So that's the main way in which we can do it. But I, I have to say that there, there is uh, less engagement with those that are directly uh, affected by, by the conflict, except through through these civil society organisations. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going actually to give the, the last word as we're running out of time to Balthazar. And, and Balthazar, um, we all look at ICRC as really as a custodian of the principles, as an organization that really does its utmost uh, to respect and apply them in a very, very complex situation. Of course, uh, all different agencies and actors uh, try to adhere to the same as well. So, um, Balthazar, the last word is to you. What, what more do you see that needs to be done? What are your reflections? Over to you. I think what is very important um, um, is that we can show to the affected populations through our approach that there is a tangible impact, that has a tangible impact. That means we must not let go of the ambition of proximity. We must be close to the populations. And I think uh, um, that means that we should not 
subcontract the risks. We have to take certain risks to be close to these populations. And I'm a little bit alarmed that the sort of tendency that we see that there are less and less humanitarian actors in some of the most difficult conflict zones around the world. And I, I would see a link to the capacity and the willingness to really, in a sustained way, uh, uh, try to be principled because we have seen that uh, other actors find it difficult, the ones who cannot or do not want to respect these principles, find it more and more difficult to be accepted and close to the populations. So I think there is clearly uh, an, an, an effort uh, to be made by everybody, and it is a challenge, including, of course, for the ICSC and for the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, not to let go of this proximity to the affected population, being close to them and try to help them. Thank you. Thanks uh, both of the also for taking also the importance of the practical situation and engaging there. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to point out that uh, on your screen you can see a number of uh, background documents that you can uh, download related to the principles, uh, which uh, we hope you'll find useful. Um, this is really brought to an end to today's uh, webinar. I'd like to, to correct that this webinar is repeated at actually 4 p.m. Uh, today, so uh, will be repeated again live. I also want to let you know that this conversation we've had this morning, this webinar, is recorded and will be placed on our website in case uh, some colleagues want to listen to it who were not able to attend to it this morning. I'd like to say a warm uh, thank you uh, to our panelists. I want to thank uh, Francis Charles, who joined us, who joined us uh, from Amman, Jordan. Uh, Francis was the advocacy director for the World Vision's uh, Syria crisis response. I'd like to thank uh, Mark Bowden, uh, the deputy special representative of the Secretary General, resident and humanitarian coordinator in Afghanistan. He joined us this morning live from uh, Kabul. I'd like also to thank uh, Balthazar Steinlein, the Deputy Director General of the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross. I know how busy all three of you are and really appreciate taking the time to, to engage with our colleagues in the field and everywhere and share your uh, reflections. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you uh, who have uh, followed this conversation from 37 countries. Uh, we hope you found it useful. We hope the practical tips and suggestions that the speakers gave are ones that you can take and apply in a practical way in your own operation. So, uh, for me, panel Kuntis, I'd like to thank you all and wish you a good day. Goodbye.